All right, so this is part two on our series on the gates of the planets, which is something that Martin Grassinger developed. And I'm joined here by Mark Germain and Michael Steenbeck Litvin. And in part one, we looked at the sun, the moon, uh, and the planets up to Saturn. And we kind of did some traditional human design keynoting mixed with Martin Grassinger's keynoting, kind of discussed. We were also joined by Richard Corbett for the first part. So if you haven't seen that, make sure to check it out. Um, very interesting stuff. We had some kind of quizzical uh, questions like, if Venus is associated with gate 25, why is it in Aries? Mm. And yet it kind of makes sense. Mm. And so what's really interesting here, this is these are the associations of the planets to the gates. Mm. So it really requires us to kind of it's a it's a redoubling of archetypes. It kind of reminds me of something Richard Tarnas said when when he criticized the gendering of archetypes because he he thought that gender itself is an archetype mm. and all archetypes can be recombined and redoubled upon each other. So, for instance, if you say Venus is feminine and Mars is masculine, well, isn't there a masculine Venus or a feminine Mars or mm. you know all of these archetypes lend themselves to being combined. So we know what gate 25 is like we also know what venus is like mm. we can see certain commonalities between them even if somebody has mars in gate 25 mm -hmm. and some kind of interesting interesting uh, combinations in that way so and you have this great graphic maybe we can show yeah um this is the image of the gates themselves uh sorry uh you, you can see um, where they line up in the body graph themselves is quite a nice way they're configured and kind of makes sense in the structure of yeah. it all. It's all the G-center gates plus the center column coming up from the root of mm -hmm. individual gates. So the 3, the 60, the 14, and then all of the G-center gates. So that's pretty right. cool. I really, I really like that. That's kind of how it ended up. Well, and to recap just a little bit is that... Um, so each of the planets have a particular gate that they're associated with, which can also be further um, looked at at a line level, both in exaltation and detriment, all six lines of each gate that are there. Uh, so wherever you have your um, sun earth, or whatever your gate, your sun earth is in, will always be influenced by uh, gate one and gate two respectively. So yeah, it only yeah. gives an individual bent to who you are as a person, regardless of your activation as, say, tribal or um, collective. Uh, an example he used was the 3740, the channel community, you know, part seeking the whole. Is, is, you think of it more of a group person, but if you have 3047 as your sun earth, then you're going to be more an individual that's a part of a group. You're not going to be as group a person as you could yeah, be. Yeah, you're going to shine and express yourself through these sun themes, which are kind of like gate one themes, personal expression, mm -hmm. through that compared to if other planetary yeah. activations make that 3740. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, so if you saw 3740 somewhere else in a chart, it, it would perhaps be more of a group dynamic tribal experience uh, looking for support and being more immersed in that versus if it was in your sun or so mm -hmm. just a way of adding a different flavor a different layer of looking at the depth of this and also he also mentions that the planet or excuse me the uh, yeah the planet that these gates are no the centers that these gates are in uh, can also impact how you flavor the uh, Synthesis, the analysis of it mm. and synthesize it together. Um, so we left off with Saturn, which means we're up to um, Uranus, which is represented by gate three. Okay, hmm. the gate of uh, ordering. So uh, where is this located is the most important place to live out one's individuality. Okay, and very individual... Uh, spontaneous initiation mutation. So wherever you find your Uranus, it has that 
gate three thematic uh, as a background filter frequency that uh, that gate gets experienced personally. Yeah, and the kind of the chaos or trouble at the beginning. I mean, I think of gate three. Uh, I guess it does kind of fit with the conventional human design keynote of the sidetrack, which mm-hmm. is what you see as, you know, Uranus is kind of what sidetracks us in life, what pulls us into a different place than we would have thought. Mm. It is interesting, though. I mean, it's interesting. Also, it doesn't have as much connection to... When I think of, um, you know, this archetype, I think of Prometheus, the Promethean, Uranian, Aquarian. I guess Gate 3 is not where I where I would initially go with that but it does make sense in that it is part of um, the well, format indi- of individuality yeah, it's individuality yeah. circuitry yeah and it's the format like you but said it's, but it's not you know when I think of it I think of almost like the aha moment of intuitive mm. um, firing of synapses in the brain or someone who's but I, I do think of eccentricity I mean these are kind of the traditional astrological mm. archetypes mm. you know we think of a Uranian person is somebody who's a bit unusual, a bit odd. Um, yeah. The single-celled organisms have the hanging gate three. They're the only thing besides humans that do. And, you know, if they didn't have that, they wouldn't assemble into more complex life. Yeah. They wouldn't, they would never like that, because that difficulty at the beginning, it's like uh, the the spontaneousness is the like doing something different, you know, because in a, in a sense, like those are just like little machines, those little, those little single cell organisms that are just a um a sacral energy center they're just yeah they're just life force moving around um but every once in a while one of them can do something different through its configurable hanging gate three it can, have, it can it yeah. can be built to have the same response to the same stimulus over and over right and you're one saying time that, it because does the, something the, the 515 different. isn't hanging right so it's interesting to see what's the difference because for those who don't know the design we're talking about here is uh Two centered, design. yeah. The two cent, yeah. Right. Which Ross said was not life yet. Interesting. Weirdly. So it's open to becoming life, right? Or right. it's it has a hanging gate that can potentially lead. To, wow, that's an interesting point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's so you know it's individual. It's also melancholic. So there's a you know there's a melancholy that comes from gate three, where um, you're looking for something new. Or there's, uh, you know, or people who are, this is interesting, as an individual, a lot of these people get uh, um, sad when um, they look for advice and they don't get the right advice. Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, As an individual, so your own individuality resides in your own inner authority, you know, in a sense, in a way. Um, So wherever you have it, I mean... um, Jonah, you have uh, your... Uh, they're both in nine. And both in gate nine. And they're both in line in one. line one. Yeah, they both mm-hmm. are. Both my cool. personality and my Sensibility. Oh, yeah. nice. A balanced and responsible approach to problem solving, which is the blue line I just read. And uh, the ability to avoid frustration through the creation of new forms. The power and focusing to create new forms. Mm. All right. And so that is where it's very important you as an individual that's what it's saying where you find that is your focus your um, power to concentrate on the detail right um, is what's important for you as an individual uh, to fo- you know as, a, as a hyper focus it's interesting we have these two well we have multiple individual themes I mean Venus also 25 mm. we have but um, Sun is like individual self expression through gate one Three is much more individual mutation or something mutation. new happening that's never happened mm-hmm. before. And so we get kind of, mm. you know, it was interesting, so, something Ross said about the 360 is that that is the format of individuality and that's where we get the theme of mutation, mm-hmm. channel of mutation. Yep. But 38, 39, which are your sun Earth. personality, sun, earth, yeah, those almost make a secondary format of individuality, but mm-hmm. rather than giving individuality the quality the quality of um, mutation, 
just made a new word there. <laughs> Watch no, out. I, I just made a new word. I was joking. The quality. The, oh, the quality. That's cool. <laughs> new word. No, I meant the quality of mutation. They give it the quality of empowerment. Hmm. Right? 38, 39 say, don't interfere with me. Not that mutation should be interfered with either. I mean, obviously there's crossovers, and obviously 39 can be extremely melancholic with it, 39, 55. And I guess 38 can as well. All individuality, all individuality has those. Yeah. yeah. All individuality requires a certain empowerment against interference and also has this potential of melancholy that works with the mutation and all these mm-hmm. things. I guess I'm just saying that it's interesting to see kind of where certain... Within individuality, the archetype of mutation is in the 360. Maybe even more specifically the three. I mean, I guess the whole channel becomes mutation, but it's when the three is combined with the sixty. Um, well, three, I think, is also the gate where sex is determined uh, in in the process. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Where it process determines whether well, it's it. male or female, if I remember mm-hmm. correctly. Yeah, yeah. It's in the process um, of, the, of the fetus development. Yeah. yeah. So, but anyway, that's where uh, wherever you find that. Uh, where is yours? My, you, you know, my okay. personality, Uranus. I actually can't. Yeah. I'm blanking on it. Mm. What's between 10 and 38 in the wheel? Oh, it's the Capricorn? Yeah. Um, 61? Is it your 61? I don't think so. 54? Mm. Maybe, the, well, maybe that's an easy one. We will check. Um, it's, uh, oh, 58. 58. Ah. Yeah. Right, the joy and improvement. 58. Yeah. Four. Mm-hmm. Which is, uh, called focusing. That's, that's, that's my design earth, and so it's interesting. My design earth is conjunct. 58.4? Go Well, on. no, it's 58.1. Uh, nice. Uh, so a natural sp- specialization that when confronted with a multiplicity of stimulations will have no inner difficulty in focusing on the appropriate influence, the energy to fuel recognition, which stimulation is of value. And the detriment and impr- uh, impressionability that becomes confused when confronted with a multiplicity of stimulations and in trying to accommodate all of it mm-hmm. becomes unstable. Energy which becomes unstable when overstimulated. So I guess you have to have a particular focus as in, you know, for you to have the you know, that to meet that strong individual need that you have. Mm. Now who also has this one is Jenny. Mm. Yeah. Fifty eight four, yeah, that can be so that's that's you know again that's where mine's 64 6 mm. in both uh which is victory um which is uh stop that and i have my mercury in 64 6 uh, yeah. on the personality side that's in Virgo. and mercury exalts it absolutely uh, the mental assuredness that knew that victory was inevitable thus making triumph sweet but not reason for excess. The mental gift of enjoying the confusion and its diversity of data. Oh, mm. I love doing that. Um, Venus detriment. Like the story of the Trojan horse, it can be dangerous to get carried away in celebration, at least one loses vigilance and perspective. All the diversity of data, it's easy to lose perspective. Mm. This is, kind of reminds me of something I was saying yesterday about... Um, with the HDHD conference and how I really have uh, let the truth fend for itself. I, I like to I like to just invite people to talk. Like mm. like I wouldn't invite Richard Mason because he's gone beyond the pale. I mean, in kind of his criticism of Raw, but mm. I would definitely invite just about everyone else I could think of mm. um, if they're in human design or if they're in offshoots of human design, like Steve Rhodes or Richard mm. Rudd doing Gene Keys or any of this. Mm. Because I like the diversity of data. Mm. And maybe it's also partly my Mercury Exalted that kind of has the faith in the assuredness of victory, of the truth. I like to quote St. Augustine, who said, um, the truth is a lion. You don't have to protect it. Set it free. It can fend for itself. Mm. And so there's this idea of victory is inevitable. The truth will win. Mm -hmm. So let's just let everybody talk about it. I mean, even... Even, uh, you know, sidereal guy, even uh, even Mason, I just wouldn't want him there because I just, there's like a, my, my limit is very, if, if you're into human design, if you're studying human design, and if you are sincere and earnest in your study, disagree all mm-hmm. you want. 
right? That's okay. If we need a diversity of data, we need a diversity of opinions. The we difference need a diversity is the, of reporting. the good faith, bad faith. Exactly. Yeah. I don't consider him to be a charitable interlocutor. Yeah, I don't yeah. consider him to be in good faith. Mm-hmm. I don't consider him. He's kind of disingenuous, and uh, has spread misinformation and so on. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I draw the line. But barring that, if you have good faith and you disagree, mm-hmm. I have this kind of confidence that victory. That the victory of the truth is mm-hmm. inevitable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same with me. I, I, inevitably, yeah. I think that's what the truth will come out. Yeah, certain truths are just there, and everything falls by the wayside. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on. Let me go over here, over here. All right, so then we're up to uh, Neptune, and it's uh, represented by Gate Fourteen. All right, the Gate of uh, power skills and material resources um, where the power where the power of one's direction in life is found the accumulation and retention of power which gets released with the impulse at the correct time Neptune acts as a shelter until there is that impulse to release the power that empowers one's direction the gates with Neptune give us our unique direction. And that is just so interesting to me because it's so different than either mm-hmm. the astrological or the conventional mm-hmm. keynotes that Ra gives. Right. Where yeah. Neptune is veiling. Almost and, antithetical, I am. Yeah, and the, the traditional reading, very similar um, to how Saturn is so different here. I mean, it's kind of the traditional reading of Neptune would be the veiling of where. We have our false sense of purpose mm. that prevents us from getting to our true purpose, which is represented by Pluto. Mm-hmm. And so there's a relationship between Jupiter and Saturn. When you violate the law of Jupiter, you're punished in Saturn. Well, Grassinger disagrees. He yeah, says there's no totally punishment in Saturn. Mm-hmm. Totally no different. And as we saw in the last video, yeah. Um, yeah, totally different. And then here also, it's not that, like, didn't Ra have um, Neptune in 48? I believe he would talk about how... Yeah, he had Neptune in 48 because he couldn't get to veil the depth of... Right, it veiled the depth. He had all this depth. He just didn't... He couldn't see it. And and that's not something you go look for. You just... It's something that... Right. Just happens. And his his sort of not self-purpose would be to be the black magician, but his true self-purpose was obviously to bring us human design and transform the world with that. Mm -hmm. Well, but that would be also where his Pluto is, according to a conventional... um, reading we have to look at his pluto placement but this is a very different reading so this is where power is retained built up until such time there's an impulse for it to be released to be released for the empowerment of personal direction Mm. Mm. so well so i mean part of the reason that in conventional human design neptune that it does mislead you that it's able to mislead you is because it keeps giving you a sort of superficial um, representation or promise of your energy signature or whatever it is that you're looking for. It keeps dangling a carrot in front of you, convincing convincing you enough to keep doing it. Like that's how you end up living the false life through Neptune is you keep in some superficial way being confirmed that you're on the right path. Mm, mm. And so that's really interesting. And it's called misinformation in one of the, in the keynote for the personality magic square. Misinformation. Yeah, yeah right. It's, it's yeah, well, yeah. it can be. Yeah, it can be, but it, if it's utilized correctly, it's not a problem. That's the no, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, it's well, like with any of the planets that are in the, um, in, whether you call it the cross or the, the diamond in the in the middle column and middle yeah, horizontal the cross, bar yeah. of the magic square, it's like it's not that any of them are a problem. They just are conditioning agents um, to a detrimental effect because of their overemphasis in society. And how society is constantly mm-hmm. soliciting us mm-hmm. to participate with our Neptune and not our Pluto, with our Venus and not our Moon. Whatever. Society kind of prefers Mercury, gossip, right. uh, Venus, pretty things, right. Jupiter, lots of celebrations mm-hmm. and, you mm-hmm. know, Christmas time and all this stuff. And then well, Neptune, misinformation. Or laws and standards to use that the human too. design. Yeah, yeah that's and, and, that's, well. and that's all the mundane. That's uh, all rooted mm-hmm. in the mundane. The rest is not. Right. There, there, yeah. no, one, no one teaches you how to work with your Uranus just in regular secular society. People aren't really yeah. encouraging you to be on the side track or whatever. Right. Yeah. Or um, Saturn or Mars or... Right. Uh, Luna yeah. Or... Uh, and the side track. Could be a side track or not a side track. Right. <laughs> mm. 
Well, you're the philanthropist, uh, is your personality, Neptune. The motiveless nurturing of the disenfranchised to ensure harmony, philosophic and humanitarian, uh, humanitarian uh, ideas. Yeah, that's gate 11, line 5. And that's interesting. Well, I have very few fifth lines. Ideas, gate of ideas, ideals, peace. I guess that's my only, well, besides my son, Earth, that's my only fifth line. I have very few fifth lines. Hmm. Well, something then, when it's time to come out and release your individual power direction, all right, is through being the philanthropist. Mm-hmm. Mm. Motiveless nurturing of the disenfranchised yeah. to ensure harmony, philosophic and humanitarian ideas. Yeah, and it's in the gate of peace. Interesting one. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's also, you know, to get ideas, it can be idealistic, too. Mm. Uh, and idealistic in and itself can be something that could be uh, correct, but then there's you can be overly idealistic, and then you know. Well, and it can be yeah, like combined with the undefined solar plexus, not self theme. It could be um, just minimizing and and dismissing in the name of harmony because eleven's looking for peace. So the example Ra uses, he said, this is the classic gate of you're tired of watching Jimmy to say. Jimmy, go play in the yard. Mm. You know, you have an idea. Mm. People come to you and they have a conflict. You have an idea for how to get back to Mm. peace, but that idea can be a dismissive idea. It's not necessarily... It's looking for harmony. And even even there, I think it it said... But but yeah, it's interesting to think of it in the context of I'm building up the energy to do that. Like, I would never have made that connection to the Gate 14 themes of empowering my direction and the direction in life of being a philanthropist. and, Mm. And what fuels my direction in life... Philanthropy is actually not the direction I'm going, but maybe what helps empower that direction mm. is that I can do the things I want to do because I can say, hey, look, I was a philanthropist here. I gave mm-hmm. back. Mm-hmm. So now let me go do this other thing that my yeah. nodal trajectory or some other trajectory is taking me mm. on because I have the energy for it. Mm-hmm. Interesting idea there. And then I, I have the eleven six on the design side. Yeah, which is uh, adaptability, the inner balance to accept transition, a blue line. And it's only in, it's in exaltation, uh, the innate awareness that all forms are transitory, the realization that ideas lead to change, and are changeable. Mm-hmm. So adaptability, adaptability with uh, the philanthropist, the adaptive philanthropist. It's also interesting to me that I have uh, the twelve three and the eleven three, and then I have the twelve six and the eleven six. Hmm. It's kind of funny. They're all on the design side, unconscious. My north and south node on the design side are 12.3 and 11.3. Mm-hmm. My design Mars, 12.6, and my Neptune, 11.6. Mm-hmm. So it's just kind of a funny little parallel there. Um, so anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, and then, you know, we can... Well, should we look at your chart? Do you have yours pulled out? Well, oh, mine's here. I don't know where I am. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's in both in gate 43, one, uh, personality Neptune is in 43.1, which is patience. So it's the recognition that new forms cannot be established until resistance has been eliminated, the depth necessary to bring into form in the individual insight. Um, okay, through power, sc- uh, limit, yeah, I guess it... <laughs> It truly is about patience until the direction comes out. You're, I mean, you're I a mean, big patience person. And, and you are. But actually I, kind of makes insights sense and yeah. that I here to share. Well, and it's funny also that it is there is a way to kind of reconcile um, the human design understanding of it being a false purpose with kind of what Grassinger is saying about it empowering your direction. He doesn't say it is your direction. He says it it empowers your direction. Mm-hmm. So it's not that you're like. It's different than if patience was in your Pluto, maybe, or was in your North Node, or was in something mm-hmm. where it's showing, I don't know how he keynotes Pluto, we'll have to see, but it's kind of a little different because it's saying the patience is what allows you to get where you need to go in life. It's not mm-hmm. where you're going, it's what helps you get there. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's through that. It's helps through that. Get there. Yeah, Adaptability yeah. helps me get there. Mm-hmm. It's not where I'm going. I'm mm-hmm. not like, this is my ultimate lesson is to teach how to be adaptable mm-hmm. and be a philanthropist. I'm like, I do these things so mm-hmm. I can get somewhere. Yeah, like, I think where, yeah. where I see it is, is, is that once it reaches a certain point, that is allowed to be that that part of you 
it allowed to be. To, you, to you release that energy. You spend that energy that's built It gives up. you that, yeah. that direction. It's like, okay, it's time. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, whatever it is, the time for you to then be that adaptable flinch fist or me be the, what was it, the one-track mind uh, uh, patience. The, the one-track mind makes a lot of sense for you. I know. 43-4, well, yeah. yeah. I have, well, I have no, 43 I... Uh, three times. So I also have in 43 six which is a uh, breakthrough. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and uh, absolutely, and that's something that's uh, part of my link note. So uh, it's a, an important aspect to who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, one track mind, yeah, well, I'm each day. I got a few things on that, and there, mm -hmm. there you are. Um, well, I'm also a personal view, so uh, I focus on what's really important. Mm -hmm. you know? So it all adds to that. My Neptune, 38. 38, 38 um, 4. 38, 4. Yeah. And 38, 1 design side. Yeah, both of you have 1, 4 Neptunes. Mm -hmm. 38, 4, investigation, blue line, analysis which strengthens opposition. And again, a blue line is something that takes a, a, a lifetime to, or over one's lifetime uh, to whatever point it becomes uh, actualized is the point of why they're there. And it's a potential. There's no necessary yes. guarantee that they yeah. will do it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, anything, yeah. One's design is potential. Doesn't yeah. mean you're going to be living it. Um, the detective who develops or the insider who accepts a joint opposition whose success can only be based on trust. The energy to recognize who can be of value in times of struggle. Um, okay. Very fourth line theme, mm -hmm. you know. No. Kind of connecting to others, networking. So through power skills, through through the fourteenth gate, through the material resources. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you can align with the right people to struggle with, and that helps empower your direction. Mm -hmm. So you want to get something done. Mm -hmm. You want to release something into the world. You want to guide you want to change however it is mm -hmm. but the way to do that is going to be through yeah through yeah. your your ability to investigate and then to um yeah and the detriment is the aggressiveness and opposition that prejudices investigation and limits trustworthiness the power of adrenaline to provoke aggressiveness mm -hmm. okay. when, when the you know adrenaline which i guess is a root theme mm -hmm. um is too great and it kind of provokes the aggression and that prevents the investigation of who would be a suitable partner to right. have reach the goal. Interesting. And 38 line one on the design side is qualification. Another blue line, it says tempering opposition based on the circumstances. <laughs> um, a psychic attunement that guarantees proper action, the psychic gift of knowing when and how to fight. Mm. Nice. Knowing when to temper your opposition <laughs> and knowing when to wait to fight another day. Because mm. it's not worth fighting in that, that moment. From that intuitiveness. Right. Mm. So the tendency in detriment, the tendency to oppose as a general rule, the drive to fight as a general rule. <laughs> so just opposition. Fighting for fights. Yeah, yeah opposition for the fight for sake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Ah, what do you say for? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that bastard. Uh, come no, here. I want to fight with you. Boards. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So let's move on. Uh, Pluto is represented by gate 60. Okay. Uh, the gate of limitation. That right? makes the most sense. Yeah. Hmm. And the way he explains it is the place where one can see the truth realized over time right years yeah. upon years yeah. <laughs> pluto represents the old <laughs> things that they need to be solved through mutation mm -hmm. was done with gratitude through the acceptance of what is and then it can change mm. so that's always the whole idea of a whole chart right or your whole design is accept the limitation of your chart so you can transcend it yeah yeah vis-a-vis you know, yeah, -vis yeah. strategy and authority right, vis -vis, right? Because you're, you're, everyone is um, 
you'll see everyone's traits and characteristics come out in their design. It doesn't mean they're living their design. It means right. they're expressing their traits and characteristics, yeah. which are always coming through. Mm -hmm. But the quality of that is what's different. Right. Uh, the frequency is, we uh, note, um, whether it's more not self or self, all right, or whether it's so distorted or they're even not even, you know, really uh, being utilized mm -hmm. um, in some way. So this is saying... Wherever you find Pluto, which matches somewhat the traditional sense, it's something, Grandma Pluto, as Ra would say, is mm. something that you learn generationally. It's a, something that comes over time, mm. long time. What to truths realize. are emerging in the collective consciousness of that generation? Cool. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's really interesting. Well, and on well, my comment just on, you know, limitation there, because I like to say this, um, I'd like to say that when people first get into human design they often wish they had this or that center to find yeah. they mm -hmm. wish they had this other gate they wish they were different in some way really the not self wants to have all 64 gates activated all nine centers all 36 channels yeah. and the, but the funny thing is that's actually we differentiate differentiation only occurs within limitation mm -hmm. and when you stop trying to be what you're not you can actually differentiate and become it's kind of like we, we take like this like limitation, like there's this huge area and we take this tiny little bit of it mm -hmm. and we say, look, this is what you are, this tiny little mm -hmm. bit, not this huge big thing. Mm -hmm. And people go, but I want to be so, I want to grow and different, right. differentiate and all that, color outside the lines and so mm -hmm. on. But we actually say, no, if you actually just draw within this, mm -hmm. you can actually make something extremely detailed and you can zoom in. And, and that unique. becomes, yeah. Yes. yeah, that becomes actually just as big as the thing outside of it. Mm. It's it's really a zooming in. It's a, you see what I'm trying to say? Oh, it's yeah. kind of a, yeah, when you accept the limitation, you surrender to the limitation. Mm. People say human design is limiting like it's a bad thing. Yeah. It's like No, it's a great is, thing because look at, yeah. look at the ultimate limitation, really, is the homogenized not-self, seven-centered world. Mm. That's the biggest limitation. Yeah, truly. It's, limita it's limiting you from being you. Yeah. I mean, that's so. This is when you look at your design and you have your body graph, these are the keys to transcend the limitation that the world is putting on you mm -hmm. and to become a unique expression of this potential that is the body graph. Because all it is, it is a, a potential. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always say when uh, people bring up type and everything, or they mention they're this person's that person, this person's that person. Yes, yes, yes. They have that design and they are that thing. But they're not really living that thing predominantly. Mm -hmm. And it's all design potential. But like a lot of things, a lot of things don't reach their potential. Mm -hmm. Or to whatever degree they do. You mm -hmm. know, it doesn't mean it's going to be fully realized. But like we were talking about, it's about flipping the script. Mm -hmm. You want to get over the 50%. You want to flip the script so you're more self than not self. And being more... Um, yourself and that takes time I, I always say that takes time mm -hmm. I mean I'm 17 and a half years in this uh, experience I don't like the word experiment really that much because I don't think we're experimenting at least not us as individuals um, but the experience I've had over 17 years uh, has been remarkable to see that transformation that the transcending of the limitations to and of the world to become more myself and I see other people do it and it's quite remarkable because then it's distinct you know it's it's different mm -hmm. um, so limitation can be a great thing mm -hmm. you know and when it's in the proper context in the context of the not self world then it you know it gives the contrast of where you have to then learn learn to differentiate from Mm. The this from the that, it gives you that it gives you that roadmap of where it is. So, um, mines and victory again. I have sixty four six four times. Wow. So both Plutos and both oh. Uranus. Oh, wow. So you know. Um, so you were born during that conjunction. Um, yeah. That really shook up the world quite mm -hmm. a bit. Right. And. Uh, so victory is inevitable, right? What are they, you know? I mean, what, you know, it's, what I equate this to is, too, is not trying to push the river. Mm. You know, just accept. Um, anytime I'm more in accepting 
and I'm, uh, I surrender to the life and just let go and go with the flow, it's always going to be better for me in the experience and end up having more signatures of success than not mm -hmm. and, and less bitterness, you know, than prior. So I think part of that relates to this in a way is that uh, there's a certain acceptance in all this. Mm -hmm. well, bottom line, you know, accept yourself. Now you mentioned something like people want to change their design. They want all these gates. They want this and that. And I remember somewhat being like, oh, projector, you know, like a lot of people when they find out they're a projector, they're like, holy shit, I'm a projector. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, it took a few moments and I realized then, time I, I really started to love my design mm. and then really embracing it over years and loving it more and more and more where I just accept that I love who I am with all the activations mm. with all the centers colored in all the openness even 12 three intentions yes. self-hatred yes. it's like well we can love how silly it now seems and how unserious even yes. how was I so serious before Ser yes. I, I cared so much about it and I, it was fun yes so, yeah, so. Exactly, because yeah. now I'm at a place where I have the awareness to look at it and say, why so serious? <laughs> you know? Even if it catches you every now and then, you know what it is, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You know what it is, and, and I think there's beauty in that because then you transcend the limitation through your awareness mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. right? It's, you transcend yeah. that because you, you're okay with it, you accept it. So it doesn't yeah. it doesn't bother you anymore. It's not a it's not a burr in the side. Mm -hmm. And you pull it out and you put a nice bomb in there. It heals nicely. And it's very good. It's stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. Something that uh, that Ra and Henri Bergson agree on is that you laugh when you see the mechanics. Oh, yes. that's that's where comedy begins. Like a person oh. slips on a banana peel, all of a sudden they're pure physics. It's like the veil is lifted, and we yeah. see that it's just a bunch of stuff moving around. It is, it is true. There's something delightful about seeing the physics emerge from where we have previously seen so much subjectivity. We now see the objectivity. Right. Previously we saw interiority. Previously we saw meaning. Now we see absurdity. Right. And that is, yeah. Yeah, because that was, that was Bergson's opposite to it. It's like that moment where he's like, if you extend your sympathy towards everything, if everything is full of pathos and gravitas or whatever, that's the least funny thing in the world. If you're invested yeah. in everything... But as soon as all that conceit and all that self-seriousness is dropped, then you're really just watching the movie and there's this, there's this yeah. com comedic distance. Yeah. And, and who's, the, who's the serious person? The not-self person. Right. You know, who's, the, you know, yeah. who's, you know, who's too serious? Who's not laughing at life at themselves? Mm -hmm. You know, who, who's offended? Uh, who, you know, that's the not-self. That's the not-self it is. Because even, you know, if, you know, there are people are saying certain things or doing certain things, you can look at it with acceptance. You know, you might not agree with it. You may not like it. You may not even, it might not even be correct. But there's a certain level where you can look at it and be okay with it. Because mm. mm. it is what it is. Mm. Wasn't Bergson a reflector? Yeah. I love uh, that. His book on laughter is kind of like a treatise on... Um, on surprise slash delight uh -huh. but again there's something about that as an energy signature that we all participate in even if it's not the focal point for most of us no but what is one of the biggest healers yeah laughter yeah yeah and just being surprised by life you know yes. you know you're Wonder watching me. the movie if you're surprised Wonder. You know? yeah. yeah you know the mechanics yeah. is just it's always because it's the foundation line one is wonderment it's it's like this the mystical path of wonder, you know, is seeing this plane in operation mm. and, and with the mechanical perspective and awareness, it's just, it's funny as shit sometimes. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's fucking comical. Everything's comical. Yeah. It's funny that it came to this whenever you look at something. Oh, so it's come to this. Yeah. So this, this is what we got now, huh? This is what we Whether got it's a plane or a situation yeah. or anything that, else. That's what I love when we gather and talk to human design people. It's like there's a language we're speaking and we just, yeah, it's okay. We got this, 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 or this. Going on. And it's like, all right. You know, no one's, you know, no one's bad. No one's good. It's just like, you yeah. know, this, this is what it is. And it's an acceptance in that or not. Because there's a lot of people who are not accepting it, not yet at least. Some will never. That's okay. It is what it is. What are you going to do? Mm. And that is a truth. 
That is a limitation that you can accept and understand. Mm. That you're not here to try to fix everybody or mm. thinking right. everyone should be. A, you're not here to, be, to yeah. save the world by making everybody get into human design. Yeah, human or, design because or even know. save your partner. That's one of the hardest exactly. things. I was mentioning that yeah. yesterday. And that's now. challenging. Yeah, the the enlightened selfishness is ultimately uh, everyone for themselves in some yeah. sense, yeah. and you know if if you if they are receptive to that, I mean yes, we are nine centered beings, we're here for receptivity, but where's your receptivity to them not being into human design? All right. Yes, so, that's huge. That's and it all course. depends on the dynamics of that, and if you're in aura with them, and what's going on with them or mm-hmm. not. You know, there's all these things that if you're remo- you know. There's different mechanics involved in all this. So, but it, you know, if someone's not ready, or they're not ever going to be ready, then you just have to accept it as it is, wherever anyone is at that given mm-hmm. point, right? And I think part of the surrender also something I really like. And I've mentioned it. I know I mentioned it yesterday. Was that Steve Rhodes uh, says that love is in the magnetic monopole, but compatibility is not. Compatibility is the characteristics, basically. I mean, that's not the word he uses, but it's basically in the chart in some sense. And you can be endlessly compatible with someone that it doesn't mean you're meant to be together in that loving sense, mm-hmm. or you can be endlessly, you, they can be right next to you, your mm-hmm. your veritable soulmate or your uh, twin soul, your twin mm-hmm. flame, right there, part of the exact same crystal that shattered in the Big Bang, right. and they can be right adjacent to you and yet, in this incarnation, you have total incompatibility. Well, that just means you can't spend a lot of time with them. I, right. I love his way of describing it is that compatibility is how much time you can spend with someone. Mm-hmm. Because no matter how compatible you are, you can't spend, nor would you want to, 24 hours a day, right. 365 days a year. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, and there's going to be a buildup where you can have, I don't know, we were talking, I was talking last night with, you know, Richard, we were talking about some uh, relationship with eight eight different you know electromagnetic connections mm-hmm. and I'm, i've been in one like that i've had a connection with mm-hmm. seven or eight yep. people look at it on paper they're coming to human design oh this is amazing all these mm-hmm. electros that <laughs> might mean that you can only spend a little bit of time with that person mm-hmm. until the love turns to hate or mm-hmm. until the one side of the binary turns to the other side and then you just need time apart and so part of the surrender to the limitation is also accepting that you're going to be compatible in some ways and not in others, and that compatibility is going to limit the amount of time you can be with somebody, that all relationships have a, a shelf life or a lifespan as well. Mm. I mean, all of these things are just very hard for the not-self mind to accept because mm. it wants to believe that love can overcome incompatibility or that love triumphs all. Well, if I love this person, why wouldn't I sleep in the same bed as them? I mean, I, I, you would be amazed how many couples... But the thing is... If one person in that couple is into human design, the other isn't, and the, the one that isn't wants to sleep in the same bed, and the one uh, that is, <laughs> their strategy and authority says, uh-uh, or says, no, I don't want to do this, or however it is that's expressed, mm-hmm. that's the enlightened selfishness. Nobody's making you sleep in the same bed as somebody mm-hmm. else. Nobody's making you do anything you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. People are so afraid they're going to like go hungry or something, but that's not how it works. When you follow your strategy and authority, you're just be- becoming empowered to be who you really are mm-hmm. and no longer pretending to be someone else and no longer hiding from who you really are and no longer denying who you really are. Mm-hmm. Well, I, again, I, yeah. all this comes down to, you know, the acceptance of what is. And it's about seeing. All this is about the opportunity and the potential to see with unique awareness. And how do we get to that unique awareness by living our design correctly through strategy and authority? through that lens of correctness versus incorrectness. So, you know, um, that's what human design could do. It can really help you, one person see um, how they're supposed to see and then see the world as it is, uh, in, as it is and as it's wired to be. So mm-hmm. it's something that, you know, this, I, I, I like, I want to thank Martin for his contributions Absolutely. And uh, his insights in, in into this, and I just when I you know listen to the class, it's called Gates of the Planets, I believe, um, and you can get it I think also on his website. But you can look up Martin Grassinger. He's in um, Germany, Austria. I forget where he's at. 
Yeah, um, he's incredible. I'm a huge fan of his yeah, work. And he, he also, he, yeah, he, has he does great... health. He does a bunch of elaborate, more health thing. And, and, mm-hmm. and Martin, for anyone who didn't see part one, is was with Ra from the very beginning of his teaching times, I think mm-hmm. early 90s. So cool. he's helped collaborate with Ra on a lot of things. And a uh, uh, longtime student and also an astrologer. So uh, somebody who knows the languaging of this uh, from another level that helps integrate it. And that's, I guess, how he came to that uh, conclusion. And, and visually, it makes sense to me the way that it's configured. It really, um, it's it's nicely symmetrical. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think, and it has two sides and it's one with the middle though, but it's like very, you know, very nice. You know, the G, the, the pressure to life and identity, I mean, in love. That's what you're dealing with here. You know, the pressure to be in the world mm-hmm. as oneself. Mm-hmm. You know, to, uh, to see the life. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's where we're at. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Mark. And thank you, Martin, for this incredible information. And uh, for those who want to find more of his work, yeah, definitely check his website. He also did two... Great interviews on John and Amy's Human Design Collective podcast, mm. which I know you've been on as well. And yeah, uh, check me out on John and Amy's podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, definitely Martin Grassinger. Human Design just, Collective, I think. right? The, the Human Design Collective podcast. It is. Yes. Yeah, and um, any final comments, final thoughts on the no, that was great. Planets and the Gates. All right, thank you for tuning uh, in. He comes in peace. No, live long and prosper. Oh, that's right. Come on. Okay. <laughs>